Thank you for tuning in to the Be Blessed broadcast. Let's go into the service already in progress. I know this word is a bit tight because it's not houses, cars, and land, but what I'm making sure we do is we provide an adequate support for our man and woman of God. See, I want us showers to get out of the mindset that we come to this building to get something for us all the time. See, when we come into his gates, this is why he said enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Enter into his courts with praise because he wanted us to understand that it's not about us. That when we enter into the tabernacle, it's not about our individual person. It's never about us. So, Moses got his arms up. Edward, come here real quick, come here. Just stand right here and put your arms up. Thank you. So, as long as these arms were up, mind you, he had a staff. Elder Burton is getting off easy. Moses had a rod he had to hold. So, you just stand right there because you Moses for a moment. And his job was to just hold up the staff. But when he gets tired, our man of God, who start losing? Okay, keep your arms back up, Elder Burton. When our leaders start to get tired, the only people who suffer from it is us. The Bible says that his arms start getting weary. And when those weary are, that the, the Amalekites started to win. So then there were two men who came, got him a rock to sit down, and they lifted up. Give me Kai, come here, Kai. Come here, man. Come and sit right here. They began to lift up his arms. Now let him go for a moment. Elder Bird, you let me know when you get start getting tired. How you feeling right now? Oh, you're tired already? Keep holding, keep holding, keep holding. This is the picture. That our leaders are always in front. See, we often think that because they're not on the battlefield with us, that they're not doing the job. You see, they don't have to be in our storm with us to make sure that we get in the victory. They don't have to be down in the valley coming to the hospital with us to make sure we get the victory. Their job is to stay up on the hill and keep their arms lifted. Are you feeling a bit tired yet, Elder Burton? Come on, I need y'all to lift up Elder Burton's hands. This is what we're supposed to do. How you feeling now? You still hurting? Keep holding them for a minute, y'all. This man, our man and woman of God, are sequestered on a hill in the presence of God. Because you got to understand that this staff represented the glory of God. Y'all have no idea how much of a weight holding up the glory of Because you got to remember, this man is flawed. This man is still, his righteousness is still as filthy rags. The best that he could ever do is still never good enough. But yet he has to hold up the glory of the Lord. And see, the thing is, is we expect him, let him go. We expect our man and woman of God to do this after 23 years. Keep holding. Elder Burton, you ain't been doing this for 23 minutes. Because imagine keeping your eyes up for 23 years. This. Their job is to keep their hands up. The job is not to be in the battle. See, a lot of times, Sonia, we put our man and woman of God in the battle. You say, how do we put our man and woman of God? Because we talking about them. We cause it mess and strife amongst, uh, you're getting heavy out of burden. You're getting strife and all this mess from, your, from the children. Then you got other things, other pastors calling. Then you got other
the ministry trips you got to do. And we just expect the pastor to keep them arms up. Don't let them fall. Because if they fall, we falling. And we do this. Stand up, man of God. We love you. We love you. But, yo, come on, man of God. Come on. The weight. They have enough weight just simply trying to hold up. The blood-stained banner. Thank y'all. Because the thing is, is that this job as a pastor is so fickle. This job as a pastor is fickle because the thing is, is that no matter what we do, somebody will always not be satisfied. Someone will always be disappointed. If the pastor doesn't get a check, that's how it's supposed to be. If the pastor gets a check, a small check, hmm, you're welcome. Let a cha- the pastor get a commis- or compensatory check. Uh, he doing too much. If the pastor begins to preach on loving the poor, uh, he must just be trying to get some more people in the church. If the pastor begins to teach on wealth, empowerment, and to the rich, he doing too much. He a money hungry preacher. If the pastor asks for an offering, he asks for too many offerings. If the pastor don't ask for offering, he's not encouraging us to give. If the pastor drives around in a bucket, it's embarrassing. Who he think he is rolling around with all them bumper stickers? If he roll around in a Maybach, he doing too much. If his kids come, why his kids not at the church? That's crazy. His kids don't follow him no more when the kids are there, oh, and them kids is bad. They get on our nerves. They start to do, do. We got everything to say. If he were to preach and use a whole bunch of anecdotes, he not preaching us the word. If he only gives you the word, he not making it plain enough. Every time the pastor does something, we got something to say. Oh, Sila, Sila. We always got something to say. And all the pastor is trying to do is keep the arms up. What's the importance of a pastor keeping their arms up? Because with the arms up, they stay in surrenderance. When you have pastors who don't continually have support to keep their arms up, It's nothing to see that pastor start putting their hands down and into the offering basket. It's nothing to see that pastor put them arms down and start talking to his spiritual daughters. It's nothing for that pastor to put them arms down and start doing things he ain't supposed to. Because this keeping up the word of God, that's his sole job. On Wednesday night, we begin to talk about some things, some statistics. And we begin to talk about how 78% of pastors report having their vacations and personal time interrupted with ministry duties and expectations. 65% of pastors feel they have not taken enough vacation with their family over the last five years. 65% of pastors feel that their families live in a glass house and they fear they're not good enough. 90% of the pastors report that the ministry was completely different than what they thought it would be before they entered. 80% of pastors and 84% of their spouses have felt unqualified and discouraged in the role as pastor. 80% of pastors expect conflict with their church members. 70% of pastors do not have someone they consider to be a close friend. 33% feel ministry is a non-healthy environment or a hazard to their families. 70% have lower self-esteem than when they entered the office and 50 cent have considered leaving their assignment in the last three months. We as the laity we don't understand the weight Because when you begin to look at Moses, this man has his own family, first of all, that done went to, oh God, he has his own family that he done sent to live with his father-in-law. The man of God 
is taking care of all these 600 plus women and children. And he doesn't even get to spend regular time with his family. All because of his assignment is behind him. And Moses and his wife You know, people have something to say about that. People always got something to say. But we begin to see, I want us to actually, I'm going to give you one point. One way we can support our man and woman of God is by praying for them. First Timothy 2 and 1 says, there, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority. I love 1 Thessalonians 5 and 25. It just simply says, brethren, pray for us. 1 Thessalonians 5, 25, Jazz. Brethren. Pray for us. Brethren, pray for us. Brethren, pray for us. Gardner Spring, there was a man named Gardner Spring who was alive in the 1800s and he wrote about the need to pray for pastors. He penned this excerpt and he said, if a people are looking for rich sermons from their minister, their prayers must supply him with the needed material. If they seek for faithful sermons, their prayers must urge him by a full and uncompromising manifestation of the truth to commend himself to every man's conscience in the sight of God. If God's people are going to expect powerful and successful sermons, their prayers must make him a blessing to the souls of men. Would they have him come into the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of peace with a pounding heart and a burning eye and a glowing tongue and with sermons bathed in tears and filled with prayer? If so, their prayers must urge him to pray their tears inspire his thrilling heart with the strong yearnings of Christian affection. It is in their own closets that the people of God most effectively challenge their beloved ministers to take heed to the ministry they have received from the Lord Jesus. Basically what this man of God said is you got an issue with your man of God, stop talking about him and start praying about him. Stop talking about them and pray about them. Because I'm here to tell you, people be people in job. I mean, it, it don't matter what's going on. People are going to be people. Uh, just, just We have Kingdom Conference coming up next week. And I'm busy. I, I mean, I'm busy. I have things that I'm doing. This is my job. We got stuff to do. And yet, I still have no shortage of people calling my phone, texting my phone, blowing up my phone. I mean, any other week, me and, me and Pastor Taylor be sitting in the house about, my phone just dry as the desert. I mean, it's dry. Where are my friends at? Where are anybody at? Somebody? Now, all of a sudden, I got work to do. We're going out to the Black Flea Market tomorrow. You want to come? No. Oh, Chris, you know, we're going to go. No, we're going to go. No, we're how about. No. See, we don't see this portion, though. Because when our friends ask us. Yep. I'll be out all night. But imagine if our man, woman of God were out all night. And they were to come and bring forth the word. Y'all. See, because the funny thing about church, folks, is y'all feel okay telling the man of God 
Apostle, this word she gave, I, I, I'm still munching on it. We got the nerve to say, not today. Pastor, she didn't do that good today. I like that word when she was talking about the Iraqadon, but when she could talk about that, uh, our pastors are a gift, I don't know about that one. We come doing all these things and all they trying to do. See, I want you all to begin to see that our leaders are just like a, imagine your job was to lift up the glory of God. And I don't just mean in the general sense like all of us are supposed to, I mean like our men and women of God lift them up. To where they have to live a circumspect life. Just in case y'all don't slip. We got a man or woman of God. They don't drink. They don't smoke. Not because they can't dance. But because they don't want their good to be evil spoken of. You got our man or woman of God. Who don't take money from the people. Who say, hey, they, they don't go Deacon Watson. You know, me and Pastor, you know, we, we going through. Can, can we just hold a couple thousand from you and daughter Watson? You don't, you don't have no pastor who do that. Imagine we had to go through like that. Holding up God. See, when you hold up God because you got both your hands up. I'm vulnerable. Because I got the... Because I'm lifting him up, my heart is open. Because I'm lifting him up, I'm wide open. All the Amalekites had to do was shoot an arrow up on the hill. How many of us could stay constantly exposed and open while carrying the weight of God? And then we have added sons and daughters who come and add pressure, who add extra weight. But we have no Aaron and hers to uplift us. See, a lot of us, I got to move quick because my time is running down. Let's continue in, uh, Jazz. We're going to stay. We're going to go back to uh, Exodus 17, but we're actually going to start in verse 1 this time. Exodus 17 and 1. At the Lord's command, everybody say that. The whole community of Israel left the wilderness of sin. Now, I don't want y'all to think sin as in the act of sin, the overstepping of God's law, but sin as in shortened for Sinai. Amen. So, uh, move from the wilderness of sin and move from place to place. Eventually, they camped at Rephidim. But there was no water there for the people to drink. This scripture is a lot to chew on. And we ain't even got out of verse 1. Another point is sometimes our man of God and our woman of God they just following God too. When we come with our questions, they don't know either. Y'all probably don't understand what I'm talking about. Let's keep going. Go to the next verse, Jazz. So once more, the people complain against Moses. Give us water to drink, they demanded. So God told them to go to Rephidim and to make up tent. But they don't have no water. What sense does that make? What sense does that make? God sending us in the wilderness. We're going from place to place, and the next place he tells us to go doesn't have any water. And the people begin to complain. But you see how people are? They don't blame God who led them to the valley, Elder Stacy. They start blaming Moses. It's 
that just like church folks? We say we're called here. We say, God, I know God put me here. Can't nobody tell me nothing about my man, woman, or God. But the moment we get some minor inconvenience, the moment we don't have no water, what's going on? I'm not being fed no more. I don't know if I'm still called to be here. Well, apostle and pastor are just simply following God. See, this is the purpose of having leaders who do this. Because when you have leaders who constantly do this, it's not about them. When you have leaders whose arms are down and they people are losing the battle, think about it. Would you want to be in a leadership like that? Where your leader looks good? Your leader smells good, but yet you never look good. You never smell good. Imagine. The children of Israel don't have this type of leader that's just leading them, and he got a little secret stash of water for himself. He out there with no water with them. So my brother Moses said, Quiet. Why are you complaining against me? And why are you testing the Lord? See, when we complain against our man and woman of God, we aren't just complaining against them. We're not just combating them. Some, we're combating the Lord. And we wonder why our blessings have been dried up. We wonder why we're not seeing the prosperity of some things because we have been over here munching up our man and woman of God and God has stopped the supply of blessings. Because you think it's about Kevin and Sean, Christopher and Taylor. You think that serving on beautification is about Tina. Tina. You think that serving in youth code is about Desiree, Tina. You think that being an usher is about LaShawn. And then we go to complain. But the scripture here says, why are you complaining against me? And testing the Lord. Why are we complaining? Against God. Well, the enemy knows that our blessing is in our man and woman of God. Pastor just talked about this, that our leaders are a gift from God. We understand. Uh, Jazz, take me to 2 Timothy 3.16. We understand that the word, our leaders have been placed here by God. They're a gift from God. The Bible tells us that these people that God has blessed, all scriptures inspired by God and useful to teach us what is true, to make us realize what is wrong in our lives it corrects us when we're wrong it teaches us to do right next verse God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work this is what our leaders are here for Jazz go back and put me in the uh, King James version all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So since our man and woman of God are leaders and God gives us this word for correction, reproof, instruction in righteousness and for doctrine. Go back so they can see that. Because God does all that, we can't be mad when our leaders correct us. I mean, you know, if we just break it down simply, me and Pastor Taylor, you know, our parents, Sean and Kevin Campbell, they tell us to do some things. And when we were younger, I wasn't always feeling them things. Especially when I got into my early 20s and you come telling me that I got to be home at a certain time as if I'm not grown. And I began to say all these little things, Deke, have all this to say. And it became a point where I, I was missing curfew. And, and Pastor the Apostle, because, you know, the way it would happen would be, Apostle is sleep. That's my son. I don't care. I know he's going to make good decisions. He'll be safe. 
Dr. Sean, on the other hand, is up, wondering what's happening. So, in turn, because she don't bother me asking me, she start, wait, uh, babe, have you heard from Chris? What's, what's going on with Chris? So then a pastor has to have a conversation with me. Look, sir, I don't know what you're doing. I don't know where you're coming from. I don't care to know. But what's not going to keep happening is you're not going to keep coming in this house after when me and your mother have said you're going to come in this house. Because the thing is, you grow, you're going to do what you want to do. But what I'm not going to be doing is hearing it from your mama. Because you're not going to mess up our union because you're trying to do what you want to do. So, two kings can't rule the same castle. So, you either do what I'm asking you to do, or you can find you somewhere else to stay, and that way you don't got to worry about uh, what's going on around here. And see, young me will be... Got all this to say. Got all this to say. And then the apostle said, no, it was pastor, because she's just like Mother Burks. Sweetie, if we can't tell you nothing, we've already come to the end of the road. And see, a lot of times, we're wondering why God's not blessing us, why God's not increasing and elevating us. It's because we're not taking the correction. See, the thing is, Pastor always used to have these lessons for us. She always used to tell us, son, because, you know, I, I done been fired a time or two. Two. Uh, and the thing was, Pastor said, son, the, you, 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 if you, you can't be doing all what you want to do with somebody else's business. And I said, well, you know, I'm just excited. Son, I see that you are excited about your job. You're excited to do what you're going to do. Not everybody can take that. Because nothing's dangerous than an insecure leader. But she said this. She said, son, you got to understand. You keep going through this. It's not, it's not by happenstance at every job you go to. You get a boss that happens to just irk your nerve. God is trying to teach you a lesson. And because you don't understand the lesson, you try to abandon ship thinking that, oh, well, God, my season is up. And you go from that skillet into a frying pan because God is still trying to get you to learn your lesson. And a lot of times, God is trying to show us some lessons and he's trying to get us some lessons by proxy of our parents, but we don't listen. Because we see it as, they talking bad to me. They trying to isolate me. They trying to tell my business in the pulpit. We don't see it, Minister Des, as God loves us so much to redirect the pastor's message just to meet us at our doorstep so he can be snatching us out of our problems. We don't look at it like that. We look at it as an issue because we like our mess. Ooh. I done took a, 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 a turn down Chili Boulevard. We like our mess. Because if we didn't like our mess, then we wouldn't have had no problems with the correction. You see, and, and the older I get, I think it's so funny because I find myself being more like my pastor. See, this is how you know a tree by the fruit that it bears because I find myself encouraging uh, everyone around me with the word of the Lord. I find myself using the word to, to uplift people, using my wisdom. To, this is what we're supposed to do. So I began to talk to one of my little cousins. I gave her some instructions on how she can get herself together because she was going down the wrong way. I mean, she was. She, she was trying to give her car back. Anybody, anybody own a car? Anybody know what happened when you default on your loan and hand a car back? Okay, so my 22-year-old cousin is going through, so she talking about handing the car back. Sweetie, hold on, hold on. 
Hold on, hold on, hold on. That's the worst thing you could do. Let's try to come up with some other options. But if she were to have a spirit of offense like a lot of us do, who he think he is trying to tell me? Well, one, I'm just your older cousin by at least six years. Who, who, who he trying to tell? He, she didn't do none of that. She listened. She listened. Then after she listened, she come texting us literally three days later saying, cousin, I listened to you. And my card was $13,000. That was the amount of the loan. And she was behind some payments. Cousin, I sold my car for the full amount of my loan, including my back payments. You see... This ain't a, uh, ain't a thing because that wasn't no prophecy. That's just simple guidance and counseling. Thank you for tuning in to the Be Blessed broadcast. We pray that you are blessed by the message. If you were, please like, share, comment, and definitely subscribe. Or if you would like to order this message in its entirety, please go to our website at www.sbfaithcity.org and there you can sign up to partner with us for the Gathering of the Eagles where you receive all the messages in their entirety for Wednesday and Sunday. I promise you won't be disappointed. But remember, here at Showers of Blessings, we want you to be blessed.